Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to Word for the World. We're excited that God has allowed us another day to praise him, another day to open the scriptures, and another day to repent. And so we're glad today we have with us again Bishop Thomas Melton, who is the presider of the Unified Churches of the Apostolic Faith. And so we're so glad that we have had this time together. And I just want to just talk about the love of God before we go further. I just want to sing a song. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, oh, to me, he is so wonderful. Yes. To me, he is so wonderful. Oh. To me, who he is so wonderful. Because he first loved me. Come on, Bishop, help me sing it. Oh, how I love Jesus. Come on, join us in your living room. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Hallelujah. Glory thank you, Jesus. We Hallelujah. thank you, oh God. God, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this time of fellowship. Yes, Most of God, all, thank we thank you for this time that we can approach your throne. For you bid us come. We thank you right now for allowing us this platform. Thank you for allowing us this virtual platform that gets your word out all over the world not just our congregations but all over the world your word is being preached your word is being delivered your word is being taught yes. and we thank you for this pandemic even though there's been such sorrow there's always a silver lining in everything you do for you said to give thanks in everything for this is the will of God concerning us. And we thank you, oh God, we thank you yes, right God. now for Bishop Melton. And thank you for the thank dialogue you. that you're going to bless us with. We thank you for this organic platform that we can just discuss your word. No scripts, nothing rehearsed, just outpouring of the Holy Ghost Glory. through your holy word. And we thank you, oh God. Bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Yes, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Welcome yes, again. This is our third installment as we've been talking about how scriptures are, are incorporated even in the Black Lives Matter movement. We understand that things uh, have a way of progressing because of a situation, because of stimulus, because things that have happened. And so we started out two or three weeks ago dealing with the Tower of Babel and how it has translated all through the years and how it has come down to where we are now. And you say, well, how does the Tower of Babel, what does it, what does that have to do with Black Lives, Latin, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Well, first of all, uh, the Tower of Babel was constructed to build a tower to God. And the scripture that they said, let us go to heaven that we may make a name for ourselves. And so the scriptures say that God said, no, nah, this is not, this is not in order. I didn't ordain it. You didn't seek my face. You didn't seek my counsel. And so the Bible says that he confounded the languages or he mixed up their languages. And ever since then, our communication, how we treat people, how we talk, how we relate to people has just been a challenge in human mankind because we do not all speak the same language. And so when we came about this Black Lives Matter movement, Bishop, uh, the Lord dropped this whole scenario in my mind and I sought the Lord. I said, Lord, why would you give me the Tower of Babel? What does that have to do with today? And this is how he broke it down because man does not know how to effectively communicate with man. And instead of communicating, we have a way of lashing out. Even in your personal relationships, you have to be careful that you don't lash out instead of communicating what is the problem, what is the situation. And so that's found in Genesis 11 uh, when the whole Tower of Babel had come into being. Then we talked about last week about the fact that um, Abraham had some had some had some uh, 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 
cheap and, and lied and, and, and the, the discourse that happened between them and Lot takes his stuff over here and his and, and other people began to uh, 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 um, um, prosper. And so that caused some dissension. And you, you want to bring in a, the, the last point you dealt with, how sometimes when other people are being blessed and other people are not being blessed, that causes some dissension. And this is where we are right now because we feel as a people, we have not been treated fairly. We have not been given due, dust, uh, due, due justice. Woo, my goodness. Pray for my tongue, y'all. Uh, and so that's how protesting has evolved in scripture. Because when one feels that one is not getting the same uh, equality or same favor, however you want to call it, it causes a, a distress among people. You want to just speak to that, Bishop, a little bit? Um, uh, first of all, we're talking about um, the idea that there is confusion. Um, and then the whole thing is, they, I don't even think they learned from that. Mm. They, didn't, they didn't learn that they needed to see God to get his permission to build the tower. Wow. They didn't learn from that. Then when he causes the confusion, they still don't see God as to how should we work from here. And they go off and they allow themselves to be divided and to be different when initially they were unified. Isn't that interesting? They were one people. Mm -hmm. So now, so just because things happen in our lives that, that cause things to be different, we shouldn't lean to our own understanding. It's always the time to, to really seek God as to where we go from here. Where do we go from here? Now that I'm in this situation, yes. now God, what do I do? And we should always turn to God for our guidance. And that's what they didn't do. So now they're confused and now they're separated because they're, they're different languages. So they become different people because of it. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like rather than working for unity, mm -hmm. it's just about my particular set of people or group of people and we have to be better than or we have to make sure we have because now we're still walking in fear mm -hmm. and we feel like you know what again the, the name for ourselves um the idea of scarcity are we going to have enough will we be able to survive as a people so they're, they're, they're still walking in fear and because fear. they're walking in fear Sometimes uh, fear causes you to lash out in ways that you shouldn't. And when you look at the animal kingdom, if they feel that someone is threatened to their domain or their house or their pride, that fear will cause you to do things that you would not normally do. Yes. And this is what has happened to the races. They fear you're going to get more than me. So let me let me let me annihilate all of you. Let me let me annihilate the the Native Americans because I fear as I come on that this is your turf. Yes. But I'm going to come on your turf and try to wipe you out. Yes. And this is not a this is not a lace of a, a lesson on we're not hating on anyone. We're just talking about the fact. And sometimes history is not always kind. It's not always pleasant, but it is history. Yes. It is history. And sometimes people want to wipe away history. So moving us forward, Bishop, and we talk about the power of a protest, the power of protesting in scripture. You don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate oftentimes in history. It's not about deserving. You can get a job. You don't deserve and necessarily deserve it, but because of your negotiation skills, because of how you present yourself, the, the how you how you are able to explain yourself will often will often land you in places you know, had it not been for God, I did not deserve that job. I didn't have all these degrees behind my name. I didn't I didn't have I didn't come from a, a wealthy family. My pedigree is not all that, but it was God and God teaches us how to communicate. Yes. He teaches us how to talk. And so the power of a protest is so important. Um, even in relationships, even on the job, you have to state your claim. You have to say, hey, this is what I've been doing this for a while. I, I brought this much value to the company. I brought this most value to this organization. I like to see myself in a managerial position. I like to see myself in a leadership role. And there are ways you can, that's all protesting, however you say it, yes. still protesting. Yes. And so moving us forward, I just want to read a scripture. Proverbs 31 and 9, 
It says, open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 21 and 13 says, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Proverbs 22 and 8. Then you know Proverbs are full of all kinds of wisdoms. Yes. Proverbs 22 and 8. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. And I'm going to stop right there because this is where we are right now. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. Yes. Right? And so as we see in scripture, Bishop, take us back to scripture. We talked about Abraham, I believe, last week, week before last, um, and, and, and what was going on in that time period of injustice and, and the fear that you have more than me. Love, the Bible is a the Bible is a great love story that teaches us about our God and how we ought to interact with Him and how He interacts with us. Then it shows us how to it shows us about human nature and how we ought to interact and how we have interacted with each other. And again, with the basis of God is love and how love should be love should permeate throughout society. Love should. We should spread love. Absolutely. Um, if we all walked in love, this would be heaven on earth. <laughs> right. but, but you have to know God or know some love of God to be able to exercise love, right? Exactly. So then so then we transgress God's love from the garden and now human nature has revealed the uh, the, the the unregenerated heart, the, the the sin that's in us. Um and the idea that we lean to our own understanding and that we don't seek God for counsel and for guidance. And when we seek our, you know, or when we lean to our own understanding, then we see how much trouble it gets us into. Mm. So, so the Bible gives us that story of what people do and what happens to them when they don't seek God or don't follow God and what happens to them, you know, when they do follow the God. The blessings, yes. And so we should learn it. Because <laughs> it's all there for us to learn. From. Right, right. It's amazing that we don't learn, um, but we see these things progress. We see, we see God beginning to deal with Abraham, and even telling Abraham that for four hundred years your people are going to be in bondage. Hmm. Um, um, we kind of forget that because it's lightly mentioned in the scripture, and sometimes you overlook it. But Abraham was informed that this was going to happen. But before that happens, we have, we get the whole story of Abraham and uh, his children and how you know they end up in Egypt uh, with mm -hmm. the story of Joseph, mm -hmm. and then they go into Egypt as being friends and brothers in mm -hmm. Egypt. The, the people loved them because of Joseph, but then they grew mm -hmm. and they multiplied. Yes, uh, it was super, supernatural growth, and so the people of Egypt became afraid. They mm -hmm. feared. I said, now this We people, fear numbers, don't we? Yes. <laughs> so much of y'all. It's just the three black people walking down the street. It's so many of y'all. <laughs> but it's not just thing of fear. And there rules of people. There rules of people that do not Joseph. And, and so then the whole situation changed. And then Israel becomes like 10 class citizens, second class citizens. Wow. And uh, so now rather than love, being loved and embraced, now they're mistreated. And so now they're 400 years of servitude, and in their hearts they're crying out for a deliverer, which was promised. Moses was promised, that, and and so they're waiting for a deliverer to come. Now we have to we have to give respect to God's divine providence mm -hmm. because when God declares that you're going to be in, in in bondage for 400 years, I don't care how much you pray, you're not coming out of bondage. Isn't that something? When God says it. <laughs> You can claim you see, we've you had a history, the Jews and the blacks, the Africans, we've had history for eons. This is not anything new. We've always been interconnected one way. We were the oppressors. Yes. And people don't want to talk about that. The black people, the, the Egyptians, right off East, 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 East Africa, were they were the oppressors of the Jews. Yes. Black right? people dealing with other people of color. Or That's other right. People. Or other people of color. That's because right. We mentioned before, you know, there's no way Jesus could have went down into Egypt to hide. How does he hide unless he's 
of similar color. That's a great point, Bishop. How, how can he hide? That's a so he goes down into Egypt to hide. Um, so we're talking about all people of color. We're not, and um, the eye, because we came from the dust of the earth. And the dust Absolutely. of the earth is color. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and so. Now I know somebody's going to say, well, they weren't Jews at the time. Okay, they were God. They were Abrahamic. Yes. Let's because I can hear somebody say they weren't Jews at the time. They weren't until after after Jacob came in. Let's say they from, were, from they Israelites. Were, they That's were right. <laughs> <laughs> we all came from Adam and Eve. They all came from Adam and Eve. And right. after the flood, but I can just hear somebody say, yeah. Well, they weren't Jews. Black people didn't impress they didn't oppress Jews. Okay. They were of the Abrahamic <laughs> covenant. <laughs> but the idea is we're all brothers and sisters because we all come from Adam. Absolutely. Or we all came come from Noah. After Absolutely. the blood, we all come from Noah. Absolutely. So we got the same blood running through our veins, but we allow differences to separate us. Yeah. We allow fear. We allow scarcity. We have the, the idea that God is not enough. Yeah. When yeah. we should know that God provides, He is enough. So when we walk in that type of fear, we get into trouble. Um, and so. And that's where the that's where protesting comes in at. When it looks like you're getting more than me and we're at the same job. Yes. We're doing the same, we have the same components in our life and it seems like you're getting more than me. And that's where racism and systemic racism comes from. So take us to Nehemiah. And I don't know if you want to talk about Nehemiah or Esther first. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. <laughs> okay. Because protesting is about raising, uh, uh, um, Getting awareness, gaining awareness. Raising consciousness. Raising consciousness for a uh, situation that, that's not uh, beneficial to a people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we want anything that's not, uh, that causes people to live below what we all should be living, we should be concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so in both stories, when we talk about Esther and Nehemiah, you're dealing with two people who were in advantage positions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they didn't have to care. They, didn't, they just could have lived their own life. But And the the, the Bible says that the king saw the countenance fallen of Nehemiah. Yes. And he asked him, what's wrong? He didn't have to. He's a king. Mm -hmm. But Nehemiah is his cupbearer, right? Yes. Nehemiah is close to the king. Yes. And the king had enough sense and had the discernment to say, What's wrong? How can I help? That's something else. How can I help you? Yes. So he was in a good relationship. He was in a good relationship. Because the, Nehemiah made the best out of a bad situation. So um, he makes the best out of a bad situation. He's in a good relationship with the king. He's the king's cup there. The king trusts him so much. And yeah. I, I believe the king loved him. Yeah. Um, the, way, the way that he treated Nehemiah. He gave him permission. And the tools to go see about his people. Yes. So Nehemiah is living the good life. He really is. Yeah. But in his heart is his people. And so I think what's important is sometimes we don't we don't try to walk in other people's shoes. Is it's that called point. empathy? Empathy, yeah. We don't we don't empathize. I yeah. mean, if, if we don't feel the pain, right. We, sometimes we don't even try to understand. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. If, if that's called a lack of compassion for us, we're supposed to be a yeah. compassionate, yeah. loving, The Holy Ghost is supposed to make people. you tender hearted. Yes. The Holy Ghost is supposed to give you compassion for people. And when you see the plight of somebody else, when you see them suffering, yeah. something in you should stir you Your or humanity. move you exactly. to want to help. Yeah, yeah. And even if I'm in an advantage position, even if I have people working for me or under me, yeah. Um, I, I, I should still want to treat them right. right. I, I shouldn't want to mistreat them and treat them like animals and mm. less than. Because for one thing, if I understand that this life is only a temporary condition anyway, mm -hmm. and that God is the great equalizer, mm -hmm. just like in the case of Lazarus and the rich man, he, you know, uh, Lazarus begs to eat the crumbs from the rich man's table. Right. The rich man lives sumptuously all of his life. Yeah. Living his life, he neglects what's around him. He has no compassion for Lazarus. So they die. So things are equalized. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the rich both man, dead. Both dead. <laughs> and now right. the rich man is suffering 
And now Lazarus is in an advantage position. Isn't that something? And now, and so so then Abraham has to tell um, the rich man that while while you were living that life, you were in an advantage position. You didn't care anything about Lazarus. Yeah, I'm not telling your brothers nothing. So, <laughs> so you got to know that this is a temporary life. So, yeah, yeah. so you should be concerned about the hereafter. You should be concerned mm. about what goes on in eternity. Right. That's what. That's what. In your mind, you should know that even though in this life, in this situation, I might be in a better station of life. That station of life should cause me to want to do good to my brother. Right, if you understand the afterlife. Right. And most people think this is the here and now, this is it, there's nothing that happens after that. But when Nehemiah had such a love for his people, and that's what I want to get back to, the fact that he loved his people, and he was not in a privileged situation so that he was not reminded, the temple is in ruins. Yes. The temple is in ruins. I'm living in the palace, but back home, the temple is 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 in ruins. And yes. so the king says, whatever you need, take it yes. to help rebuild your people. Again, to your point, that talks about relationship. Listen, the children of God, it's good to maintain good relationships. The Bible says a good name is better yes. than rubies. Maintain your good relationships. Yes, even with mammon. Yes. Because we can help each other. So Nehemiah didn't get so far as the king's cupbearer that he forgot who he was. He forgot where he came from. And this is the problem in society. People are forgetting where they come from. Yes. They forget. And so God has got to remind us and he's got to jar us back into reality. Look, you weren't always living in Brookfield. You weren't always living in River Hill. Exactly. You weren't always living. You didn't always have that Harvard degree. Yes. So, so we try to help as much as we can. And people have helped us, right? Yes. So, so, so Nehemiah uh, says, thank you. Let me go do my people. You know, people say, let me just do me. No, he wasn't, he wasn't self-conscious so much that, that it was just about him. He went back to rebuild the temple walls. Yes. And we know we're not getting into Sand Ballad and Tobiah. This is not that kind of show. I want to say show. This is not that kind of Bible class. But the power of protesting, he didn't even have to protest. All he did was he was sad. Yes. There's different types of protesting. Um, and then he was able to rebuild the walls because he had help. So people who say, I don't need no help, yes, you do. Everything that you have amassed in life is because God touched someone's heart like the king to help you. So yes. the power of a protest. So again, Proverbs 22 and 8, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. So as we talk about Nehemiah having the heart to rebuild, um, so whoever reaps, whoever sows an injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. And we see that the injustices that are plaguing our nation. So we're in the midst of a, a health pandemic and we're in the midst, we're in the midst of a health pandemic and we're in the midst of a racial pandemic that is affecting everybody. So let's talk about Esther. Esther like Nehemiah, was in a great position as a queen. She was groomed to be queen. She was a young teenager. They groomed her for a year. The Bible says that they bathed her, put her in spices and perfumes. They bathed her, they groomed her for a whole year before she married King Ahasuerus, okay? She becomes queen and her people are still in abject poverty, if I can say that. Now, people say her uncle, it was really her cousin, Mordecai, was the cousin of, was the, was, was the son of her mother's brother, which made her their first cousins. But because he was older and wiser, he was like an uncle, more like a father figure to her. After Esther gets to the palace and she's, she's enjoying life, she's doing this, then her cousin, says to her in the fourth chapter, wait a minute, um, you didn't just become queen for nothing. Remember your people. And then he says in the fourth chapter of Esther, who's to say that you did not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Yes. Bishop, speak to that. She, uh, well, the thing is, 
um, when you are dealing with a world that's chaotic, mm -hmm. um, um, the fact that the wages of sin is death and sin causes so much damage mm -hmm. and um, causes us to, to walk in injustice, causes us to oppress, uh, causes us to be jealous and enslave people and do people wrong and not show love. Um, um, then there are people that are getting that are put in situations where um, they're treated horribly, and so now, and you got people that just don't like you just because of your your skin color. Or just it's been ingrained in them not to like you. Where you come from? Yeah. So I don't. Was it Haman? Who was the guy that went to the king and said, you "Yeah, got, you got a bunch of yeah Haman uh, people here. Yep. That, that's in this land. Yep. Who?" They, they're not. They don't mean to do you any harm. Uh, they don't mean to do you any good. Yeah. They won't be loyal. Mm -hmm. He talked against them so that he got uh, permission to really go out and kill every one of them. And so when uh, Mordecai became aware of the decree yeah. that was passed, um, <laughs> we, we can't allow this to happen. There must be something that we can do. So, so here is Esther in the right position, in the right place at the right time. Um, even though she's living in a privileged position, she yeah. has concern for her people. And up until this time, she hadn't made them aware of who she was. Absolutely, her, that's her the key. Background. They didn't yeah, know. Yeah, they didn't know who she was. Who she was, and so then. But the eunuch found favor on her. Yes. And said, "Let me groom, groom you for this." Yes. So it's interesting how they did not know she was a Jew. Right. And they groomed her to be queen. Yes. And she was wise. She said, "King, let me have a dinner for you." Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so as they were choosing, he was in the process of choosing his wife and uh, he didn't he didn't choose from the thousand or the hundreds he let them get down to the last few women that he wanted to choose from and then he came in mm -hmm. to make his choice mm -hmm. but she was among or she was probably the most beautiful woman in the kingdom and um, so then she pleased him and when she pleased him he says I'll give you anything you want yeah, that's what she said. He said, "Have the kingdom." Have the kingdom. <laughs> that's not that's another goes between men and women. <laughs> that's another whole subject. I give you what you want. Up to half the kingdom. Right. So, right. so, so he chooses her, and and he gives her uh, that ability, that that uh, desire to have whatever she wants, and so then she advocates for her people. Yeah. So many times, you know, you can be in a privileged position, and if you have empathy, you yeah. advocate. You're in a position of power. You're. It's important to be in a position of influence. Influence. You never know how God is going to use mm -hmm. you to advocate or protest in a way that it raises the awareness that's needed, and that you change the hearts of the people who are in power and in control. But thank but God really, she had a Mordecai. Yes. Because she was living this life. And then it says in, in Esther, the fourth chapter, verse 14, for he says, listen, remember who you are, Esther. Yes. Remember who you are. You might be the queen. You might be the queen, but remember who you are. He says, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there arise a respite and deliverance to the Jews from another place. Yes. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You're in position to help your father's people. Awesome. You're in the position to help your family. So those of you who have, have, have arisen, uh, uh, to places in society where you can help people. And as pastors, we have employed people. We have done things for people and not to toot our horn. It's just what we're supposed to do. Yes. We're supposed to help people because somebody helped us. I like this version. If you, allow, if you allow me to read this in the Amplified version, he says to Esther, if you remain silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place. In other words, if you don't do it, God's going to let somebody else do it. Why not be the conduit yes. that God uses you to bless somebody else? Yes. He says, right from another place, and your father's house will perish since you did not help them when you had the chance. Wow. And who knows whether you have attained royalty wow. 
for such a time as this and for this very purpose. Look, I'm getting goosebumps because we're all been put in position to help somebody else. Yes. This is not a partial thing. This is not a melted thing. This is not a Christ thing. This is a Jesus thing. And God has empowered us that we may help other people, even during this pandemic season and even during this Black Lives Matter season. So the power of a protest is very, very important. Bishop, you you, you were about to say something else about Esther. Well, if you, if you, in helping others, you help yourself. Absolutely. And so that's how God generally works because Again, it, it, it preserves her family and her right. household by helping others. So um, many times you, you want to think of another way to do it. Mm -hmm. and you think you have the power to protect your own. Right. But again, this is all about God's divine providence and what God wants, what God's will is. So um, he expects you. Uh, he expects you. To do his will. To do his will he and to help you. other people. Yes. So that's what, that's what we need to do keep our minds on how do I please God and in pleasing God yes I call myself we are we are his hand we are yes. the extension of God yes we are God's oracles as preachers and teachers of of, of of the holy writ but we're also an extension of God's mercy we're an extension of God's justice we're an extension of God's loving kindness toward man and so um, we, we just have a few more minutes. I want to get into what does protesting do. And, and as we have talked about protesting in scripture, we've given you just a few examples. There's a lot of examples where people had to stand up and cry out for righteousness or cry out for injustice. The Bible speaks about speaking on behalf of the widows, of the orphans. And so who, who is that? Who becomes their voice? But the people of God. Who becomes their voice? But uh, uh, as pastors, we are the voice of our congregants. We are the voice of people. Uh, we have the influence, and so we are to help them. And so just a few things about some of the things that protesting has done, in particular because of, now we know that the Black Lives Matter movement started under, as a as, as result of, 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 of Trayvon Martin and all that. But now let's see what protesting has done. So some of the ongoing demonstrations have already prompted change in the city council, in the state line, in the statewide things have happened in the last, in the, in the 30 days following uh, George Floyd's death. Editors have resigned, statues have been toppled, police reforms have been announced and in, in several cities across the, the United States. So here's just a few things, Bishop. Some of the things that have changed because of protesting because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Derek Chauvin was charged with third degree murder, I think is up to second degree now, second degree murder. Um, a police officer involved in the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor in Kentucky has been fired. Um, so many things have happened within 10 days of that, Minnesota bans the chokehold. There's some things that have happened. Ado uh, Dallas adopts a duty to intervene rule that requires officers to stop other cops who are engaging in inappropriate ex uh, use of force. So, so what is it? I hear the church for what is protest to do? You're only seeing the other side of protesting of the damaged stores. Yes, they're they're seeing that that people's uh, 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 stores and have been damaged and streets have been littered. You're not looking at the greater good. We're talking about Israel. We're talking about Esther. And some of the things you've been involved in the Black Lives Matter movement here in Milwaukee, you've seen some things firsthand. What would you say to people who say that protesting doesn't work? I, I, just, <laughs> I just don't think that uh, they're thinking in the right way. I, I think that, you know, if life is good for you, it's easy to be in your cocoon or in your bubble because life is great for you. You know, you're not affected. Um, and many times people don't want to get involved until it happens, until it hits home. That's it. And now you want every, now you want people to be active. Yeah. Pray for me, saying we tried to get the prayer meeting before you can come. And when, <laughs> when, it, when it wasn't at your doorstep, right. you know, you right. want to be involved. Right. Um, so, so people should cry um, loud against injustice uh, because it can happen to you. Um, you, I mean, well, Bishop, it has happened to us. Yes. Everybody who's watching me, everybody who's watching me, particularly in our culture, you've you've known of 
a cop pulling over your nephew. I've got stories of people in my family who had been just without cause. Now you're supposed to be with the cause, probable cause, right? You've had people in your family. You have been stopped <laughs> over. You've been you've been pulled over. Yeah, exactly. So what does it take for the On my bicycle. Oh, come on. Right. I, my job as an accountant at US Bank. Riding my bicycle from my house because I'm concerned about my health. I, hey, I can ride my bicycle to work, get some exercise in. I'm riding my bicycle to work and the police officer pulls me, you know, pulls me over, saying that I jumped license the, and registration, please. <laughs> saying that I jumped the light, which was absolutely ridiculous in a busy intersection. All I was doing was standing up just to start get, to get going, to push the pedal. Um, but he says I jumped the light. It was incredible. He was just messing with me and didn't let me go to work. Most of the time when I'm pulled over, they let me go. They just stop me just to be stopping me. Um, I, I've been stopped because, I mean, I'm, these are recent things. I'm 58 years old, so I've had a... You know, this is going out all over the land. It's <laughs> not in the house. <laughs> I have a number of things that have happened to me since I've, especially since I've been driving at 16. Um, and I used to get stopped all the time then. But I got top, stopped one time for driving uh, five miles under the speed limit. And wow. I, I told him, I said, I purposely drove slow so that you wouldn't stop me. Mm. And I told him, you still stop me. And I, I don't know if he had that laugh at himself. And then he lets me go. Um, I got stopped again because the officer said that he couldn't see my, my license plate. But my license plate was perfectly fine. He couldn't see your license plate. Yeah, so he lets me go. Was it they on? Me was, it behind, me go. was it on you behind, under your bumper the way it's supposed to be? Or yeah, no more. No, no more like normal license plate. But so just it. little irritating things. People might say, "Oh, that's nothing," but those are like little that's irritating amazing. things that, like, do I have to? I mean, I might be running behind. I'm late for an appointment, and you just pull me over for no good reason. So just a little irritating thing, let alone the things that lead to uh, whether I'm going to live in my encounter with a police officer. But just little minor irritating things. We don't, we don't we want to live without those types of things. Just don't pull me over just because I'm black. And many times, you know, that's the way. Driving while black, eating while that's black, the, sleeping while black. <laughs> I was looking at a video um, just last night. A guy uh, was walking up. Uh, in his neighborhood around his block in pajama bottoms just listening to music he was just out for a walk mm -hmm. and the police pulled him over saying that um they were looking for a guy that fed a, fit another description mm -hmm. this guy did not fit that description but they pulled him over and harassed him anyway it's just little things that 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 bother you bother you because you want to feel free and you think that police officers, we love police officers, we want them to protect and serve. We just don't want them to harass and then even take it further to brutality. Um, but we want to feel protected, not afraid. Every time I see a police officer and he pulls up behind me, I have to, I, I get chills or whatever. Yeah, I don't want to feel yeah. that way. Right. That I know he's going to stop me over or, you know, he's running my plate for no good reason. I haven't done anything. So I know people that are in privilege who don't experience those things, they don't understand. And so again, it's walking in somebody else's shoes. Um, and we should always, you know, try to understand. I, I, and, and there should be a push for young people as well. I mean, you might, you know, your parents, you might be living in your parents' home and you're living a good life and all you're doing is playing video games and you're having fun and it feels like you're unaffected by what's going on in the world. Um, but just because something isn't happening to you, right, right, it could happen. Absolutely. And so don't don't put yourself in a bubble un and, and be unattached to what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. Things are happening that could possibly eventually one day affect you. And that's why awareness should be raised. And that's why. And we have to have these conversations with white people, yes. because as long as we discuss it on this platform, yeah. unless unless our white brothers and sisters can be a part of the movement. And people say, why do we always have to invite white people? Why can't we do it our own? Because we have, we need help. Because mm -hmm. they're in a position of changing the narrative. They're in the position of changing the course of how we're perceived. Yes. And so sometimes it takes one of them to stand up and say, stop, stop, stop harassing them. Yes. 
this. Stop profiling them. And so we have to have a conversation. So what the Black Lives Matter movement has done, it's caused people to have conversation. It's caused yes. people to communicate. And they can they can they can disregard the misnomers. Oh, I thought that's how people felt. No, if you talk to us, you would know how we felt. You would know how we felt. So there's some there's some there. I have a, a plethora. So we don't have a lot of time left, but I have so many things that have happened as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement and all the things that have changed in Maryland. A bipartisan work of state lawmakers announced a police reform work group. So they're starting to, to change some things. Los Angeles Council introduces a motion to reduce um, LAPD's $1.8 billion operating budget and funnel that money toward education and allow to have certain awareness. But you can't, Bishop, no matter how many seminars we have on culture, diversity, and sensitivity, it's a heart issue. Yeah. It's a heart issue. And this is why people have to pray to God, ask God, give me a clean heart. David says in, in, in Psalm, give me a 51, give me a clean heart. And so God has got to wash the hearts of men and women to let them know when injustices are, are prevalent, that we may change the narrative on just who we are. So you have to have self-reflection self-reflection and self-realization of what this is all about as we try to incorporate the scriptures today just to let you be aware that this is not something new people have all, always protested when they felt that someone was being in israel was in, in captivity many times bishop in and out of captivity slavery we want to talk about slavery right now but Whenever there's an injustice, the Bible says to hear the cry of the to hear the cry of those who are experiencing injustice. And I read you three or four scriptures in Proverbs where where Jesus told where, where the Bible speaks of injustice. The scripture that I didn't read, I didn't get to, but was was in uh, Deuteronomy when when Moses says, "And I charged the judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man." his brother or the alien who was with them. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment belongs to God. And then he says, if the case is too hard for you, bring it to me and I will hear. This is, this is when Moses assigned those men, the Jethro principle, some people call it. And so it, it, it's just about hearing, right? Hearing other people. You have a, a final comment, just just trying to encapsulate everything as we go. I, there, there's a the other side to it is that there are Christians, there are people that think that we shouldn't be protesting. Thank you. That they think that we have a victim's mentality, mm. and that we should be so forgiving that um, you know we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be crying and. Um, we should just go on and live our lives and not have this victim mentality. And so uh, th there is a group of people out here that don't think we should be protesting. Now what they add to it is that they say that, okay, uh, you guys are not just talking about Black Lives Matter. You're also being anarchist. Mm. You're also uh, trying to promote things that are against our Christian values. And so they focus on those things that are attached to the Black Lives Matter movement that they feel go against what we should, should uphold as Christians. So that they don't even see the it's idea. It's hard to see the problem when you're a part of the problem. Yeah. And they don't even see the idea of that we're expressly talking about police brutality and we're talking about justice and we're just talking about fair treatment and equality. Um, so, so they'll turn the conversation from what we're protesting about mainly to the end, to the fringe things that attach to the, the Black Lives Matter movement. So that's what they're that's what they're focused on, and that's what they're so against. Mm -hmm. And when they see the violence, when they see any violence that attaches, mm -hmm. because I don't think that that's what the core of Black people who protest in the Black Lives Matter. Oh, absolutely Matter. not. That's not, violence is not the It's problem. about peace, yeah. peaceful protest. Right, right. But when they see the violence, that overshadows what we're doing peacefully. That's true. So that's what's happening when you have people who are opposed to 
the protest. But in essence, why would you make people aware of an injustice? Why would you make people aware that I'm being mistreated? If I continue to slap you, at some point you're going to say, what are you doing? You're protesting what I'm doing. I want to forgive you, but I don't want you to keep beating me. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, what do you mean? Right, Just right. forgive and don't have a... Right. No, I'm still being victimized. Exactly. It's still continuing. And because so many people in the church are silent because they don't know which way to go. Pastor, should we protest? Should we just, you know, uh, uh, turn the other cheek? Well, I ain't have the two cheeks, Pastor. Now, which one am I going to? I mean, you got people who are militant, and I understand that. I understand that fashion. Um, with that, we have to go. We're out of time. But with that, would you just state what's going to happen this Saturday with the ministers and anyone else who wants to join us? This Saturday, we're inviting everybody who would like to come join uh, join us uh, on Fort Illinois, in front of the, the fifth precinct mm -hmm. the fifth district police department. On that corner, uh, a bunch of pastors are going to get together, and whoever wants to join can join us in prayer um, um, to pray for the peace of our community because we're praying for police officers as well as those that are protesting in our community. We just want things to be right. We're fighting for righteousness. We're praying that people's hearts are, are touched and that our, our community is really healed and that we have a better relationship between uh, the police department and the community and those who govern us uh, and we make the laws. So we'll be in prayer. We'll be in prayer Saturday morning at 10 a.m would like for you all to join us. Amen. Thank you. Well, this concludes our broadcast for uh, this, this Word for the World. We encourage you to join us this Saturday, live at 5. We're going to continue our series on how to build an altar. We have Apostle Leon de Garman, who has done an excellent job on just on dissecting the components of the altar and what it means to build an altar in your home, seeing how we can't come into the sanctuaries in mass. So please join us. We have a very lively discussion. Wonderful, wonderful join us. So we thank you so much. Bishop, would you just close us out in prayer since I started in prayer? Oh God, again, we're, uh, we're seeking uh, your guidance. We need wisdom from you as we continue to approach the injustices that are happening within our society. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we know that you're soon to come um, and we're seeking to please you and to do your will. We're just asking that you help us uh, even in the midst of chaos and what's going on, Lord God. You have a plan and our desire is to please you. So God, we're looking to you for your help and we just thank you for all that you continue to work out uh, for us. We just give you thanks and we appreciate you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.